Okay, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for 3 and 30 Messages in the Landscape. Uh, my name is Katie Donrat. I am the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the BMFA, and today is my privilege to um, welcome my colleague Izzy Fuqua, the Interpretation and Digital Projects Coordinator here at the BMFA. And she's going to talk about a few pieces that correlate um, with our current special exhibition, Dawi Bay Elegy. So with that, I will pass it off to Izzy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Katie, for having me today. Um, we are going to focus on three works of art that are currently on view in the permanent collection, specifically in our Lewis Focus Gallery, just off the mid to late 20th century galleries, and then two pieces that are in the 21st century um, galleries. Uh, but I wanted to start with grounding us in the special exhibition. Uh, because we are in the virtual environment, you do get to see those images. If you haven't been down to BMFA to see this exhibition yet, I highly recommend after this talk, getting your tickets and coming on down and taking a look. It is stunning. Um, I was able to work closely with Valerie Cassell Oliver on the development of this exhibition, so I've learned a lot and was able to make these connections uh, to the three works of art in our permanent collection. Uh, okay, with that... So this is a, a portrait of the artist Dawood Bey, um, taken by a photographer at VMFA um, named Sandra Sellers. And this was actually taken during a time when um, Bey came to Richmond to work on a commissioned piece that's featured in the exhibition. So uh, Dawood Bey Elegy opens with a photographic series and an accompanying film that, were, that was um, taken in Richmond and inspired by the landscape of Richmond specifically the banks of the James River. The title of that commissioned piece is Stony the Road. Uh, it was completed in 2022, and it is a part of the permanent collection of the museum. You're seeing half of the series on screen here. These are very large format photographs, four feet uh, by three feet roughly. Uh, so they are meant to feel very overwhelming to the person um, standing in front of them. You can see we're looking at pathways, vegetation, trees, leaves, light upon water. Um, it's as if we are walking the banks. And here is the other half of the series of photographs. And so with that, I wanted to um, think about why landscape and why is this so important to Dawood Bey. He's actually well known for being a portrait photographer. If you were to look him up online um, after this talk or during, um, he's well known for his um, street portrait, portrait photography. But this exhibition marks the first time where it's only his landscapes being shown, and specifically landscapes of Virginia, Louisiana, and Ohio. Um, so we're seeing a real absence of the person. And I took that and thought about, well, what are other artists doing? How are they showing landscapes and how does it relate to um, us, the people who inhabit them? So the first work we'll see um, is an installation currently on view in our Lewis Focus Galleries by Athena Latoka, another image of the artist on view um, on your screen now. Um, this is an installation shot. The exhibition is Athena Latoka, The Past Never Sleeps. I hope you're getting a sense of the scale of these works. They are floor to ceiling. Um, as long as the walls, they are monumental. Um, they are three works on paper is roughly what they're called, but they really are mixed media. The artist would start with a um, photographic paper that's really coated in a resin to give it um, some substance, and then she would apply things on top, often shellac ink. That's in all three of the works we'll see, but also found materials from the landscapes that she was in. Dirt, moss, um, other things like that. So we'll take each work one by one. The first is Burning Sulfuric Violent. It was created in 2020 when Athena Latoka was um, completing an artist residency that took place in the World Trade Center Tower 4. Uh, she commented that she would um, be looking out at um, sunsets and uh, from the windows. And specifically, uh, she said that 
um, the sunsets appeared as if the the land was aflame. Um, and so it got her thinking about this idea of the presence of people amongst nature, which is a very common theme in art history in general. But in, in Athena Latoka's practice, she's taking it a step further. She is um, abstracting these landscapes. We don't necessarily, we can't really discern sky from land. We don't see people. I should say that with um, a grain of salt. At the Tuesday in-person talk, someone said they saw a person in this piece. And I couldn't see it, but that's not to say it isn't there. Um, but this idea of people in relation to landscape, um, and again, the absence of um, a real figural identifier here. The next work is Bulbansha, Green Silence, created in 2019, uh, re referencing um, New Orleans. Um, and specifically in this work, it, it's not a great photo, and I apologize. Again, I hope you're able to come down and see these works in person. But this um, section kind of in the top right, where it looks darker and almost appears alive as if it's growing, that's actual moss that uh, Latoka sourced from um, the area where she was going to be inspired by this piece. Um, so it's Spanish moss that was um, sourced from this location. And then the third work, It Came from the North, created in 2021. This work is inspired by uh, Brooklyn and specifically uh, a cemetery there. Um, she went to the cemetery and uh, found rock formations on the ground and brought pieces of metal with her, these four sections that you're seeing, and pressed them into the rock to create these reliefs, for lack of a better word, brought them back into her studio and adhered them to the picture plane. Um, this kind of uh, patchwork effect that we're seeing, the idea that there's multiple picture planes, um, is something that she started to do more and more in her work. And I think uh, kind of hints at something that we'll see in the future of another artist who is looking at um, landscape in a, um, in a map sort of way, in a schematic type of way. Um, now, Latoka uh, did uh, study um, art, art formally, um, she, and she did work on landscapes in a smaller scale, but she commented very keenly that she didn't think that she was, you know, serving her artistic drive. She didn't think she was doing what she was meant to do. And so when she started to take things off the easel, work directly on the floor and blow up the picture frame, work monumental, she realized what she was trying to do, which was to create a landscape that existed before human existence and then confronted us, the viewer, with the fact that this landscape will be here far after our time. So it's the idea of the effect of people on a landscape and how a landscape can outlive um, the people who are affecting it. These are incredible works of art. They are, um, like I said, currently on view now, will stay on view until January 14th when they will rotate off view. They are a part of the permanent collection of the VMFA, but given the sheer scale, uh, I am not certain we will see them uh, soon in the rotation. I hope we do, but uh, they take up entire walls. So if you are able to, I, I encourage you to come on down and um, see these works in person. Okay, so with that, we will keep on moving over to our 21st century gallery. And I wanted to um, have you recall this concept that, Lato oh, actually, I should just show you um, a picture of the artist at work, um, her working on the floor. You can see she has her um, picture plane sort of rolled up here. Um, and then she's working with an actual rake um, to move this uh, material off and around the, um, the picture. So um, the next artist we'll look at also worked aerially, um, not only physically, as Latoka is doing here, but in his inspiration. So let's take a look, go over to 21st century, and we're going to look at a work of art um, by an artist who recently passed, Sam Gilliam, uh, passed in 2022, but was a very well-known um, abstract artist, specifically working in the style of the Washington color field. Um, if you don't recognize um, this work uh, as being a signifier of his work, you might be thinking about draped canvases, um, these beautiful, voluminous um, canvases that 
would be uh, kind of pinned up to the wall and then color would be bleeding down from the top. He was very well known for that style. Um, but this piece, and specifically his work in the late 70s, early 80s, showed a shift away from that style and more working on the canvas. Um, so we are seeing a more uh, traditional canvas style piece here. I should say that the canvas is very large, again, similar to the scale of the Athena Latoka, taking up a whole wall. Um, and it is uh, a, a beveled edge, which uh, a viewer brought up on Tuesday, which was really interesting, and I think harkens back to Gilliam's breakdown of um, sculpture and paint. It almost makes you question what exactly Exactly you're looking at. Are you looking at a painting or is it a sculpture or can it be both? Um, and then specifically, we'll look at some details here. Uh, a similarity to what we saw in Latoka as it came from the north, this very um, uh, geometric separation of space here. We have these yellow squares kind of set off by these uh, purpley uh, maroons um, right here. And specifically, those are um, adhered to the picture plane, just like what Latoka did. Um, Gilliam was known for working on multiple canvases at once. And uh, as he moved from one canvas to the next, he might take one, cut it, and adhere it to another. And that's exactly what he's done here. And that also bleeds over into another series he was doing where it was inspired by quilts. Um, in quilting patterns. That series is known as the Chasers series, which is a quilting pattern style. So let's take a look, though, at what um, Gilliam was interested in in his um, Of American Cities series, specifically what you're looking at on screen. It is an aerial view um, of um, the American landscape. So let's look at side by side with his um, final painting. I think we can absolutely see that with these squares here. It's almost like a blocking off of the city structure as if you were in a plane and looking down or um, if you were um, uh, looking at a map. Uh, I it, On Tuesday, I sp specifically said a Google map. You know, you like zoom out and you can go back further and further and slowly the city starts to lose its identity a little bit. You don't see people. You can't recognize roads, uh, key landmarks that cities are known for. As you get back further and further, all of that is stripped away and you're left with this kind of um, residue of human imprint on the landscape in the form of urban planning, right? Where the roads are going to go, um, how the city is going to um, remain connected. So let's look um, again, going back to the texture that's at play here. Uh, Gilliam also worked with a rake, much like Latoka. He would work on the ground. And so all of these um, beautiful textural lines you're seeing that kind of contrast with um, the stark, hard edges of these squares, those are all um, caked into um, the paint. It, if we could touch the work of art, it would be bumpy. It would have texture. Let's um, take a look at a picture of Gilliam in the studio. This is a photograph by Anthony Barboza that's in the collection. And if you can look closely, you can see Bar um, that Gilliam is holding uh, his trademark rake here, um, covered in paint, splattered, uh, but he would actually take this rake to make these lines. Okay, so um, that was uh, Gilliam, apologies, um, and we will, if we were in the galleries, all we would have to do is uh, turn around and we would be at our final work of art. Uh, this is a work by the artist um, Theaster Gates, a contemporary artist working today in Chicago. Um, the title is Glass Lantern Slide Pavilion, and it is a um, art object in that you are encouraged to walk through it. So if you were in in the gallery, you could walk right through and take a closer look at the details. I would have encouraged you to look up at the ceiling, take note of the details on the walls, um, and the materials used. This is an important part of Gates's practice is sourcing materials from the locations where he's choosing to um, create in and about. Um, here is another view of Gates's piece. Um, you can see it has kind of cavities cut into it, almost as if they're windows. Um, there are objects in there, and I have more details to show you. But we have um, 
different um, quality wood grain here. We have tile that appears to be broken, but adhered back onto the surface. Um, so this is a picture of Theaster Gates actually standing in front of um, uh, what's called the Dorchester Projects. Um, this is a uh, social project of Gates. He actually um, identifies as a social practice artist, meaning that um, his art and the sale of his art goes right back into the location where he chooses to create, specifically on Chicago's south side on Dor Dorchester Avenue. So what he would do is he would take buildings that um, were otherwise condemned and renovate them. And the materials that would come out of that renovation, he would then put into art objects like the glass lantern slide pavilion, sell those, and then that money would go back into his project of what he was doing in the south, in, in the south side of Chicago. Um, the the foundation that he has is called the rebuild foundation and these buildings are ultimately sometimes used as residences but there are also community art spaces libraries um anything to kind of give back to the community so let's go back to the art object now and figure out what he's doing in his practice that's so rooted in landscape um so we've already kind of talked about materials a little bit here. The fact that you're supposed to experience it, it is a pavilion. Um, if you think about the function of a pavilion, it's meant to provide shelter. You can go into it and feel covered. Um, the other pavilion we have at VMFA is our South Asian pavilion. We can't walk in that one, but just kind of making a connection there to this being a functional object, or um, that's why it's titled that way. Um, and going back to these materials now, I hope they're making a little more sense. Uh, this this wood that we're seeing is is from these houses. The tile is from the houses. There's um, it's I don't have a good picture of it, but there's actual carpeting that was pulled up and applied back onto this art object. But let's look at a couple of other details that we are not getting such a good look at. So this is the ceiling of the um, of the work. It's and this is where the title come from comes from glass lantern slide. That's exactly what these uh, objects are. They're glass lantern slides, as as would have been used in old art history classes. Um, so if I were to zoom in on some of these, they would be traditional um, art historical images of sculptures, paintings, things that were considered high art. And uh, Gates sourced these. These are largely obsolete now, right? Based on what I'm doing at this moment, using digital images and PowerPoints. So what happened to all the slides? Gates reused it in this art object. And he's he's making a connection between what he's doing as a contemporary artist of making this art object out of found, repurposed, resource materials, and comparing it to what was considered fine art. Um, is actually asking you to consider that comparison as you're standing there. Look up at these works of art and then look around you. What's the difference? Um, other details. Uh, here's a close up of the tile application. Um, I love the wood grain specifically. If you look up Gates's work, he also works very monumentally, um, as did Latoka and um, Gilliam. And specifically, um, this kind of like thin panel wood floor. Um, these are very deliberate choices he's making and how he's placing these. There's um, a beautiful color uh, pattern to them, and it makes your eye travel down the work of art that's very intentional in his process and then the teacups i wanted to point out the teacups that are um, situated on this window right here and then this is the same view um, Gates is also a practicing ceramicist, a potter, um, so works with his hands to create um, functional objects. And uh, he believes that um, there, there's something very transformative in, in the power of art, uh, art's ability to transform something from something as lowly as dirt dirt in the ground um, to something beautiful like a teacup. It's not that Gates created teacups, um, but they're meant to be sort of a symbol, a symbol for what he believes his art is capable of doing. What all art is capable of doing is transforming lives, transforming communities, um, and transforming landscapes. The last thing I wanted to point out, and I didn't include a good detail about, of, of it, it's um, this square right here. 
it is a um, coiled up hose. Um, and that that hose has to do with um, uh, kind of an allusion to civil rights era protesters who were um, protesting uh, racist um, housing practices. Um, and the, the fact that um, the, the hoses were used on them to disband the groups to stop the protests um, and and Gates is including that here critically as it as it calls back to why is he rehabbing this certain street? Um, why did this street fall into such disrepair? Um, and what community is he giving back to um, in in his artistic practice? So uh, today we looked at uh, four works of art technically. Um, I I highly encourage you to go down into Dawood Bay Elegy. Um, the exhibition is broken into three sections, roughly. Um, the first is Stony the Road. That's the commissioned work of art by the MFA. It's a photographic series and an accompanying film. And then you go into um, uh, in this here place with an accompanying film titled Evergreen and then Night Coming Tenderly Black. Uh, and they are beautiful moving images that tell a story of um, someone, an, uh, an enslaved individual entering into, into slavery um, on the banks of the James River, going and living the life of an enslaved person on a plantation. And that's what Evergreen is documenting. Um, and then going into Night Coming Tenderly Black, it's actually documenting um, the last stages of the Underground Railroad steps to freedom. So it's truly a narrative journey. And I think the challenge comes from not seeing people, that you are challenged to um, step into that landscape and experience this. Um, we, we made connections to works of art on view, specifically Athena Latoka, The Past Never Sleeps, which closes soon, January 14th. Um, and her focus on the idea that land will outlive us and it predates us. Um, so another great opportunity for you to view works of art that um, don't feature the figure and um, try to uh, make a connection to that. Uh, we also looked at Gilliam and his inspiration in aerial views and mapping. Uh, and then we ended with the Astor Gates and this idea of a social practice artist who is using his art to give back to the landscape where he chooses to live and work. Thanks so much, Lizzie. Bye, Katie. Bye.